like if you were grading this class as a whole, this edge class, uh, what grade would you give it? I'd give it like a B minus. Mm, uh, that seems generous. Like a, yeah, like, you know, just kind of an incomplete grade because all of these guys do have different question marks. Um, you know, we could look back in five years and say, man, this class was abysmal. Uh, we could also look back at five years and say, hey, there's, you know, a couple of all pros to come out of that list. So, uh, you know, there's some guys that have some some promising traits, but uh, if they were completely polished, we'd be talking about them in the top 10. Yep. Uh, no edge players expected to go in the top 10. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see any def – well, I bet we see – potentially just one defensive player in the top 10 if the, assuming the Cowboys stay where they are and, and Lord knows they could take an offensive lineman because they're sort of uh, losing out there. Very good chance. We don't see an edge player taken until the second half of the draft. We'll start at the bottom of your list. And these guys are all kind of clumped together. Gregory Rousseau out of Miami, your number five edge rusher. Yeah. So it actually ends up being flipped from where uh, we started this process because, you know, he was considered a top 10 prospect um, shortly after the draft last year, uh, a guy with incredible length. Uh, he decided to opt out of this past season. Um, in 2019, most of his production uh, in, in terms of sacks came over interior offensive linemen. Um, so you would be expected to be quicker than the interior offensive linemen. So a lot of people wanted to see how he had developed over the course of a year um, and see how it translated to the field, but we didn't get to see that. So uh, there's just a little bit more questions when it comes to Gregory Rousseau. Um, he has been training with Chuck Smith out of Atlanta, who uh, has been, you know, really good working with edge rushers and, and using their hands. Um, so I'm curious to see how he he takes that to the field. Uh, but his pro day, he did some good things. Uh, the 40 yard dash was was pretty good overall. The 10 yard split was good. Uh, the agility drills were a little concerning. It was a little slower than maybe what was anticipated. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I was told he put on like 20 pounds from where he was listed last year. So you can kind of understand, um, you know, where it's coming from, but it's, it just adds to the pile of question marks. So uh, he could end up being the best edge rusher in this class. I just don't feel comfortable projecting him there at this point. Yeah, a lot of questions surrounding him. He has a Miami teammate who also has questions as well. We'll talk about him in a second. But first, Aziz Ojalari out of Georgia, your number four edge player. Yeah, he is uh, a very active player. He can play standing up. He can play hand in the dirt. Um, he can drop into coverage. He can rush the passer. I'd like to see him work on his pass rushing diversity a little bit more, um, add a, little, a few more moves to his arsenal. Um, but a really talented player. His younger brother, BJ, is a really talented player at LSU as well. I think he's probably a name to know for you know a year or two down the road. Um, but Aziz is a guy that can go mid to late first round. Uh, we're talking about the Cardinals, the Colts, the Titans as teams of potential interest. Um, and you know Rousseau, late round one, early round two is kind of where we're looking for him. Uh, I consider the Browns, the Ravens, a team that you know values length and looks for that in that position. Uh, the Buccaneers and the Jets as, as possible destinations uh, for Gregory Rousseau in the bottom half of the first round or early uh, into round two. But yeah, those two guys, um, again, lots of skills, uh, very talented players, but you just, you just have a little, a few concerns. Is Ojolari a guy that needs to be scheme specific or, I mean, like, you know, like in other words, is he sort of a outside linebacker in a three, four defense? I mean, can he, you know, how like, would he fit with a team that has a 4-3 defense, or is he really more specified to that 3-4? Yeah, I think he's got some versatility. Um, yeah. I think he could possibly play hand in the dirt at the next level um, as a 4-3 defensive end, but um, a guy that is going to offer versatility because, uh, as we'll talk about uh, with the defensive backs, the more that you can do, the more value you have for a team. So um, Ojolari is a guy that you know, can potentially drop back into coverage and provide the quarterback with some different looks uh, as opposed to just being a one-trick pony. And Ojolari, too, like still kind of raw as a pass rusher. I mean, like he's very, obviously a ton of upside um, because we're talking about him in, in this vein. Uh, do, do you think – I see Pete has Pete Prisco has him going 21st overall in his latest mock draft to the Colts and noting that he seems to fit what the Colts like in their edge players. Agree or disagree? Yeah, I agree. I think you're you're kind of looking in that Justin Houston mold, um, a guy who I believe is still unsigned, 
uh, but yeah, has, yes. has, has been productive with Indianapolis over the past couple of seasons, you know, um, kind of dipping into that fountain of youth and giving them a little bit of pass rush uh, assistance off the edge. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of what you're thinking with the Zizo Ojolari, a guy that um, is, is obviously going to give you some youthful infusion into your, your uh, defense. Um, but he can do everything. I mean, like I said, he can drop into coverage. He can rush the passer. So uh, the versatility, you know, would be, would be great. In Matt Eberflus's, Eberflus's system. Uh, all right. So we mentioned Ojolari as an edge player. However, worth noting, and I'm sure Debo has this prepped you, if you want to bet on Ojolari at William Hill, you can do so but he is listed as a linebacker. So in other words, you would not uh, you would not be wagering on him as an edge rusher or a defensive lineman. It would be as a linebacker. We'll talk about that more in just a little bit when we talk about the linebacker. Sorry, Diva, I didn't mean to throw you under the proverbial bus. Number three, Joe Tryon out of Washington. Yeah, this is uh, an interesting player because he's kind of polarizing in the draft circles. Um I am in the group that likes him a little bit more. Uh, whereas, you know, there's some others that think he might still be available as you get into day three, or I mean, into, into round three, rather. Um, I think he's got a high floor. I think he's also got a high ceiling. Uh, he's got a tremendous motor, fast hands. Uh, I think he could use them, you know, a little bit more efficiently uh, to, to really polish his pass rushing skill set. Um, and I think that's where he has the most room for growth. Uh, if he's able to lock in and, and get that corrected, you're talking about a guy that you know has tremendous potential and is going to be a, a key difference maker in the NFL for whichever team drafts him. So uh, I'm thinking late round one, early round two for Joe Tryon. Uh, I look at the Browns, the Chiefs, the Jets um, as some teams that you know could possibly use his services. It, the the guys who are we're mentioning as these edge rushers. It's really, I think it's really gonna be fascinating. And, and you can see first guy off the board, first defensive lineman off the board. I mean, if you're, if you're splashing down on, on this bet, Joe trying 50 to one, that seems pretty unlikely to, to happen, but you know, I'm not paying a buck 80 for Quiddy pay. Uh, I would consider Jalen Phillips at, at two to one. I actually do have a bet on Christian Barmore at eight to one or seven and a half to one. Maybe I don't know if I even really love it because I, I just, I guess my point is, Josh, I don't know what is going to happen once we get past really 12 or 13. I think the Chargers are probably taking an offensive lineman, but anything is is fair game there. They could certainly go with a, uh, with a cornerback. I, I think Minnesota, they're taking cornerbacks in the first round all the time. They need edge help. They could use quarterback help after Kirk Cousins is gone. The Patriots are a wild card and could trade down. It just feels like it's, it is a very unpredictable second half of the first round and i mean isn't it possible that that these teams are all over the place in terms of how they have these defensive linemen on their board yeah no question this is a year where teams have these guys ranked in a completely different order i mean you may talk to one team that has the fourth or fifth guy as their top their top edge rusher whereas you talk to another team that you know has their fourth or fifth edge rusher is somebody else's number one edge rusher so it's just it's a very um i don't want to say toxic but it's a very polarizing year for the position because there's no consensus i mean everybody loves what jalen phillips brings to the table uh, but we'll talk about, you know, what kind of makes him a little bit of a question mark as well. So every one of these guys, like I said, has, has their own question marks um, that teams are going to have to dive into, and that's going to ultimately determine how comfortable these teams are, are to taking them at which spots in the first round. Yes, it will. Number two, we mentioned Jalen Phillips and Quidi Pay. We can just leave that graphic up there while we talk about him. Uh, Quidi Pay is your number one edge guy and, and Jalen Phillips, the other guy to Miami, your number two Phillips seems to be, I think if I were betting on this right now, like I said, I have bar more, but I'm a little worried about that just because edge edge is so much edge players are much more valued in the NFL draft than you see interior defensive linemen. So I would probably go with Jalen Phillips if I was dabbling in this in this particular market right now just because he seems the most likely out of that group to really leapfrog Quiddy Pay. Does that seem fair? Yeah, that's a, that's fair. I think that's uh, probably a good direction to take. Um, I'm probably not as high on Christian Barmore as some others in the league. I think he's a really gifted player and a possible first-round pick, but 
Um, there is some buzz that he could possibly go in the top 20. Um, and I don't know if, you know, I would be willing to take him there at that point. You're kind of banking on uh, seeing more consistency at the position and some of the upside that we've seen um, specifically in the playoffs from this past year. Um, Jalen Phillips, I mean, another long Miami edge rusher. Those those Hurricanes were able to kind of rotate the edge rushers um, this year with Quincy Roche on the other side as well. But uh, Jalen Phillips is a former number one overall high school recruit, uh, committed to UCLA, actually retired from the game for a little bit uh, for medical reasons and decided to transfer to Miami. Um, so that's the biggest question mark surrounding him. You kind of have to dive into, you know, whether that was a flash in the pan. Um, if what we saw this past year is kind of who he's going to be and maybe even continue to develop. I mean, you might even be able to bring more out of him, but um, I think that's what a lot of these teams are trying to decipher at this point is, you know, whether or not they're comfortable taking him with, you know, a premier top half of the first round pick. Uh, at the end of the day, I think he probably is a mid to late first round pick. Um, and I look at the Vikings, like you mentioned there at number 14, uh, the Raiders who, you know, love traits uh, and the Colts as possible fits for, for Jalen Phillips. All right. You know what? I think I'm going to revise my take on this one. Uh, I'm a little worried. I mean, look, I'm not questioning his dedication to football. I am, however, questioning if a guy took a year off of college football, who is a you know premier recruit, premier prospect, you know, premier draft, you know, premier draft prospect and a guy who is productive at, at multi, like, he, he retired for a year because of concussions. How is an NFL team going to draft this guy in the first round? It's tough, but that's where the conversations that they're able to have with him come into play. Um, I think they're allowed to do five Zoom calls this year with each of these prospects that last about an hour. Um, so, you know, more than we've seen in years prior, the scouts that have sources inside the building and, you know, do the detective work to – kind of dive into his past and talk about his, uh, you know, with his childhood friends and his teachers and, you know, all of his coaches and just trying to get to the bottom of who he is as a person and as a player, um, you know, and then as they have these personal conversations with him over Zoom as well, you kind of, you know, uh, come to well, your I, own. I, I, may, I may have even phrased that, not to interrupt you, but I, I wasn't questioning his personal ability, like his personal love of the game. I'm not questioning that at all. I'm questioning – if he gets two concussions his rookie year, is he going to play beyond 2021? I, that's That would be a major concern for me and a major a major concern for his health, of course. But if you're you're using, you're talking about a top 20 pick. Now, the upside is, of course, there. But that is a, that is a pretty substantial risk for a, a first-round pick. It is, and we're having a similar conversation, um, albeit a different injury, with uh, Virginia Tech cornerback Caleb Varley. Um, you know, that has to be taken into consideration, like you said. So uh, it's a weird year in the sense that, you know, teams would love to to get their hands on some of these guys and uh, be able to go over them medically and, you know, kind of determine their own prognosis to report to the head coach, the GM. But, uh, you know, we're having to do things a little bit differently this year. Yeah, certainly medical is harder to come by. That is a storyline I think to watch in the next week, and I, I don't I don't want Jalen Phillips to slip. I hope he goes in the top ten. Well, actually, I take that back. I hope he goes top fifteen because top ten will be expensive for me. But I want him to go top ten because I you know I want him to get I top fifteen because I want him to get some money. But man, it will be interesting to see if an NFL team is you because you if you draft Jalen Phillips in the first round, you're gonna have to you're gonna be asked questions immediately after the 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 draft about your comfort level with his medical, his medicals and what, what will happen if he suffers concussions his rookie year. So I, I'm not saying he's going to drop, you know, I think there are plenty of smart talent evaluators and plenty of smart people around the league, you know, plenty of smart people who talk to people around the league that have him high up in their drafts and their mock drafts. But I think that is at least a, a, a bit of a red flag on draft night for me. If I'm looking at props to you know, talk about where he would, uh, where he would go, et cetera. Uh, your number one guy, Quidi Pay, who has a great name, fun name. It, it just it just kind of rolls off the tongue. Um, strong does. strong player uh, knows how to turn it up when the game you know when his team needs him the most. Um, I'm not the biggest fan of his stance pre snap. It's it's kind of weird to me. He's almost flat to the ground, um, which is great if you want to establish leverage and uh, you know be more effective in the run game. But he he kind of 
lengthens his stride a little bit and makes it a little slower for him to get out of his break um, or at least get off the blocks. So, um, you know, he, you can potentially quicken his get off there at the next level. And that's an area where he can improve. Um, I look at the giants, the Eagles, the Vikings, the Raiders, um, some of the teams that could possibly in the, be in the mix there for him in the teens. Um, I think that's probably where he's most likely to go because as we've worked our way through this list, I mean, you kind of see some of the question marks that have unfolded with a lot of these players and Quiddy Pay is probably one of the more clean prospects at the position. So, you know, when you're talking about teams possibly being more risk averse this year, uh, Quiddy Pay is one that checks that box. All right. Mm. I got to tell you, I'm not feeling a lot of edge rushers going early on. The one guy you didn't mention there, by the way, Jason Owa. Owe? How do I not get this guy's name right? It's very easy. Is it Owe or Owa? Owe. Owe. Come on, Brinson. Get it together. All right. So Jason Owe, you have, I, I assume he's either six or seven on your, on your, uh, your edge rankings. Yeah, he would be six. He would okay. be six. Um, you know, he's, he's got tremendous potential. I mean, we all saw what he did as Penn State Pro Day tested off the charts. Um, his sack production was just simply not there. I mean, he had zero sacks this past year. Um, you know, and a lot of that is finishing capability. Uh, he was getting into the backfield. You just got to be able to finish those plays. So, um, you know, as you're looking through this class, trying to figure out who has the skill set that maybe you can polish a little bit and turn into an all pro player, Jason Owe is one that kind of jumps off the page as potentially being, you know, a, a high reward kind of player. Uh, we've heard comparisons to Daniil Hunter, who has been very productive yeah. in, with with the Vikings, but um, Daniil Hunter was also a third round pick. So you kind of have to be aware of the investment. But with Owe, it's it's simply those traits that are going to have teams very interested in the back half of the first round. Okay. And also, I'd point out that if you want to make the Daniil Hunter comp, that's fine. Oa is 22 years old right now. Daniel Hunter was 19 years old when he got drafted. I mean, that's a that's right. a huge difference. You know, that's that is three years to develop into a pass rusher for Daniel Hunter at the professional level with great coaching in terms of the Vikings versus Jason Owe, who you know would be 25 at the end of that developmental period and and working on a new contract. So, right. yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying he won't go in the first round, or not saying he won't be good, but cer certainly, you know. That technique, the skill set, the ability to get off the edge. You know, you want you want to see that early on. And if you don't, that could be something that pushes him down the board. All right. 